Okay. So, first things first. Um, so, are you going to help me with grading? <laughs> yeah? Okay, the solutions are on Blackboard. Um, I think all of them, I got them from Leo, except for the one about um, the permutation and combination rules. I guess the rows and columns <clears throat> and how they translate into the rotation matrices and the 48 um, operations, symmetries of the cube or the uh, octahedral, octahedron. Why does it have 48 symmetries? Vanessa, you solved it. I guess the easy way, or one easy way to see it is uh, this is a, oh, it's a cube. So if you rotate it by nine degrees, it's still the same. Uh, 180 degrees and so on so you can look at the positions of these atoms we have one here uh, wait zero 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 um, one zero zero uh, this one will be zero, one, zero, and so on. And then you can also have the negatives. So you can have plus or minus, and they are repeated. So you can have two, 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 and two. So there's uh, eight here, yeah, right? And then the other one, you're going to have six in the way you can you start doing the permutations here. So you multiply them and you get the 48. It's a figure that has the most symmetry, as you might imagine. Well, I guess the, the one that has more is the, the sphere. But that one has continuous and I guess infinite symmetries. All right, so we're going to uh, start with something um, that it's close to my heart. And so finally, I get to teach something that I know about. OK. So this is chapter 6. And the chapter is called Oscillations. No matter what do we work on in our group? Which are what? Um, they are, yes. So if you have, well, I guess maybe it will look like this. Um, Leave this one here. I'm gonna be using these dots. Not to play that game. How, how is that game called? You make like squares. You know, when I was a little kid, we had like these uh, sheets with the square pattern, and we will still put these dots in there to play. Mm -hmm. Little OCD. 
Um, so if you have a displacement pattern, maybe you know this one is over here, this one's gonna move a little bit over here, this one's gonna move a little bit over here, and you know, this one's maybe gonna go back to this position, and this one you know kind of looks like it's in the uh, original position. So you have these. Um, you know, maybe this one is doing the same thing, or maybe this one is actually moving towards this one. So you just have these waves, and you have three kinds of waves. If you have, well, two kinds. If you have um, an atom here and another one here, the wave can displace like this, right? So this one moves uh, in the direction of this one, so this one has to move. And so this will be a longitudinal wave. The other one is you have an atom over here, you move it in this direction. And this one, you know, maybe it is attracted or there's some sort of you know, like lower potential over here, so it's gonna move in this direction. And then when, we, when this one moves back, it's going to follow. So this could be another one, it's a, one of the transverse modes. And the other one is like this, right? So this one is like this, and this one moves like this. So you have three modes, but one is in the I guess the displacement is in the direction of the wave propagation, and in the other ones, the wave propagates in a direction that is orthogonal to the displacement of the atoms. So oscillations are kind of cool. You definitely find them in solids, but you know they're they're pretty much everywhere. So what other examples are there of oscillations? Spring? Definitely, yeah. So maybe you have you know the simplest case. And you have your spring over here with some mass, and it can be oscillating back and forth. So this will be the equilibrium position, and then you have your displacement. This will be the amplitude. You know the other, or I guess minus amplitude. So this one will be moving like this. What else? The other common ones that you often solve analytically in your mechanics classes. Pendulum? Pendulum? It's going to move back and forth, back and forth. What else? What about the rotation of the Earth around the Sun? Is that an oscillation? You know, um, I guess you have the Sun over here. You can have the Earth orbit like this. We can start to see it, you know, a little bit as, at an angle. Right? We can look at it like this. So then we'll have the Sun over here, and the Earth will be doing this, and this is indistinguishable from this, right? So it's an oscillation. Uh, I guess the solar system rotating about the center of the Milky Way, we don't know if the Milky Way is rotating, you know, well, I don't know. I don't know if other people know. Maybe the Milky Way is also rotating, you know, about some center of, uh, of gravity. Uh, we know that when we have a high density of galaxies, like the other ones, definitely rotate around. And there are some weird places um, in the universe that seem to have no, no mass, and yet the galaxies are rotating around it. And so it's possible that you know, there's a lot of like dark matter over there. Anything else? So I guess in its more general definition, an oscillation means that something is just repeating. So if you wanted to find a potential in which this will happen, 
what will be the shape of that potential? Give me a function. Yes. Can it be something else? Yes? Who said yes? What else could it be? What do you think, Marcos? Sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> so a parabola will definitely produce an oscillation, but why? Okay, so we put our parabola here. It's a little bit asymmetric, I'm sorry about that. What causes the motion to be uh, oscillatory? Turning points. Wait, is it that? Turning points. Turning points, okay. So where will you put your turning points and what are they? Put it over here. Is it the turning point over here? Over here? Yes? <coughs> if I put the uh, turning point over there and the kinetic energy, uh, mechanical energy, so kinetic is in this case T plus potential is constant, where will the other turning point be? Same height? Okay, so these are the turning points. I'm glad you remember your, um, your intro mechanics. What is, what is the definition of the turning point? What happens there? Well, I guess whatever you have in here turns. Can we be a little bit more precise? Daniela, you look puzzled. It's just how much sure is it is around the conditions or something. <clears throat> um, yeah, I think if, I mean, I would say not necessarily. Mm -hmm. But if you want to give an easy boundary condition, I think that will be a good one. Okay, so the velocity changes sign. Yeah? Velocity goes from positive to negative or vice versa. So <coughs> if it changes, sign, that means that at this point, the velocity is zero, right? So if you plot velocity as a function <clears throat> well, we can plot it as a function of time. I guess it makes this one easier. So if, if your particle is moving in this direction, then it is going in the negative direction. So the velocity is negative. But as it moves up, what happens to the velocity? It's decreasing in magnitude, still negative. And then over here it's gonna go, it's gonna be zero and it's gonna become positive. So it's gonna be traveling in that direction and it's going to increase. So it's going to look something like, 
Maybe like this? Right? Okay, so turning points, important. Um, <clears throat> a few things that I wanted to mention about these parabolas. Oh, they have the green one. So parabolas have an axis of symmetry. In this case, it's this one. And they are <clears throat> symmetric uh, about that axis. <clears throat> If it is centered at zero, what is the equation of the parabola? Okay. Um, what if we wanted to adjust how narrow or how wide it is? here. <coughs> Excuse me, that run. <clears throat> Is that correct? So if you're, if A is larger, let's say we have two cases, case one, this is, um, this is case, case zero. I don't know how to write zero in Roman numerals. Uh, K zero is just y equals to x squared, or I guess a x squared, but a is equal to one. <clears throat> so what happens if a is greater than one and a is uh, less than one? Which one? This one? It becomes narrower? Are you sure? Yeah? So if A is less than 1, then it needs a lower value to have the same Y, no? Oh, okay. Okay. Pedro, there were only two possibilities. <laughs> I'm kidding. It's fine, it's fine. <clears throat> so, you can make it wider, or you can make it narrower by adjusting the A. <clears throat> so, Let's say case uh, one is this one. So I don't know how to write this. I mean, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go to the way you will write it if it's if this is the the potential energy of a spring. What is the potential energy of a spring? One half of k. K. I need to write delta x to remind me that it's a displacement from the equilibrium. <clears throat> but it, it is x squared. <clears throat> so then a is a constant. So I can just add the 1 half in there, which is a constant. And so k is the, the spring constant, right? So if the spring constant, <clears throat> I'm going to put it over here. Spring constant K 
I'm going to call it k star, is much greater than 1, <clears throat> then this spring will be very stiff, right? So spring, high spring constant means that you, know, you have to exert a lot of force and it will move just a tiny bit. So it is the narrow one, um, actually this one, <clears throat> and this one, um, spring constant k is much less than 1. And this is very wide, and this is a very, um, very loose, you know, very easy to, to compress uh, spring. <clears throat> so your, uh, you know, the shock, uh, shock absorbers in your car, um, are they, do they have a large spring constant or small? My computer making a noise? Or? No. Okay. Uh, could you repeat that? Larger? Yes. Why? How would you say no. that? If you want to hit a bump, you don't want to be oscillating up and down. Unless you do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So usually they're pretty, pretty stiff. <clears throat> they cannot be infinitely stiff. What will happen if they're infinitely stiff? You absorb the whole. You will feel the bump. Right, because it will be a rigid body; it cannot move, and so it will transmit that energy you know, directly to your where you're sitting. So you know you want it to be stiff, but not extremely. And you know if you wanted to, you know, like those low riders, they go over a bump and they like they continue moving like this. I don't know if you have seen them. So yeah, that's a low. <coughs> um, yeah, it's a low spring constant, small. Okay. So, <clears throat> good. So in this case, you know, where we have the potential energy and the kinetic energy, um, the mechanical energy is a constant. That means that at this point, all the energy is what? Potential. There's no kinetic energy because the velocity is zero. Where is the velocity maximum, and hence the kinetic energy maximum? The potential energy is maximum, right? So here the potential energy is minimum. <clears throat> you can say that it's zero. So all the energy is kinetic, has maximum velocity over here. So there's a relationship between the kinetic energy and the potential energy. What's that? Maximum surface Yes, for sure. This is the mechanical energy. In this case, is conserved. So, uh, let's see. I don't know if you would like my derivation, but <clears throat> we have one half of mv squared. plus one half of k and delta x squared. So <clears throat> if you, or if you can derive the, you can isolate the velocity here. So we get rid of the one halves and this is k delta x squared <clears throat> divided by the mass, square root of this. So we can take out the change in the displacement, and then we have k over m. In this k over m term, you have seen it. If you take an average velocity, so the change in displacement divided by the change in time, and you can take, you know, maybe from here to here, so it will be the, the average velocity in this, um, I guess, not back and forth, just like from here to here. <clears throat> then we can move this one over here. And 
it will be these displacements. And that's uh, square root of k over m. And you know, these ones are in this approximation, well, I guess in the average. They're the same, so they cancel out. And so if you take the average, which is not very accurate, uh, you get what? Frequency. Frequency. It's an angular frequency, actually, but it's difficult to know that right away. <clears throat> but you know the units. Um, should be one over a second. I think this is what um, Newton per meter. I mean, this one is uh, kilograms. So this is kilogram meter <coughs> per second squared, get rid of the kilograms. This one goes over here, it's meter squared, and then you have the square root. Um, wait, 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 no. This one can start with this one. So you have one over second squared, square root. One over seconds. Okay. We can be, so now we know that this k over m is a frequency. Um, we know that if k is larger, then the parabola is uh, stiffer. And so if the parabola, if the <clears throat> spring constant is stiffer, the frequency is what? Higher or lower? No, no, frequency, not, not one over time. Let's call it uh, omega. Call it omega, it's fine, omega. <clears throat> it's a constant. If the, the, pra, the spring constant is stiffer, the angular frequency or the frequency is higher. Does, do you think that makes sense? This is narrower, and so it has you know, less room to uh, wiggle around. So it has to move faster, but it's also inversely proportional to the square root of the mass, so if it's more massive, it's going to move more slowly. I think both of those things make sense. You know, if you want to go into the thermodynamic aspects of this thing, if the space that you explore is larger, the entropy is larger. So if you have a, a solid, will prefer to explore largest space as possible. And um, you know how, f how much uh, an atom can move from its equilibrium position is going to determine, <clears throat> in part, whether a state of matter or a particular crystal structure is stable. OK, so we can be a little bit more precise here. But at least we have a good feeling, you know, for what k and omega are. So if we take the derivative instead of the average, uh, we have velocity is the x dt. And we know that it's equal to x. In this case, you have to take x because it's the position. <coughs> Um, square root of k over m. So we can move this one over here. We have the x over x. And this one we can move it over here. So we have square root of k over m, which is a constant dt. We can um, integrate on both sides. What is this? Hmm? Integral? Yes, what, what is the integral of dx over x? Natural log. Okay, natural log of x equals square root of km, k over m, t. And, you know, plus we have a constant over there. So if we take the exponent of this one, 
and the exponent of this one, we get x is equal to e of some this constant, k over m square root, times the time, plus this constant. So this plus we can, some multiplication here, and e times a constant, it's a constant. So we can put it over here. Um, <clears throat> this is pretty suggestive already, what is it? If we just let it like this, and you let time go to infinity, what will happen? The position increases, right? Mm -hmm. Like, infinitely. <clears throat> we know that that doesn't happen, so what's going on here? Since it's rotating, you can put the i over there. This is an imaginary number. And what is that? Yep. So this is, <clears throat> we can call it C0 uh, cosine k over m times the time plus i sine, uh, well, I guess another constant, c1 sine of the same thing. Cool. What about to me? What's that? What about like what about to me something? To me like especially for me exponential i some i times a divide you have to divide by two. Mm. Yeah, I guess. Really? Don't we need the I? the I only. Oh, yes, sorry. Yes. I don't remember if there's a one half, um, but in any case, we have the constants over here. So we can leave it like this. Um, you know, the main point here is that this is uh, oscillating back and forth. So we have the, the I guess, the, the wave solution. Um, okay, so if we want to plot the, I guess I started doing it over here. If we want to plot the velocity and the position, well, we can get the position So at time equals zero, what is that equal to? C zero. Yeah. So you can put it over here, right? This is the position. And it's gonna go, I mean this has to be in radians. I guess it's, a, it's going to be a circle. So at, you know, whatever, t makes this equal to pi, it's going to be 0, right? So this is going to be like this. Uh, well, uh, well, this should be lower, but. So this is minus c0. So c0 is the amplitude. If you take the, the derivative of this one to get the velocity again, um, actually you can almost leave the sign out. So uh, you could do it with the appropriate boundary conditions. So the velocity is the derivative of sine, cosine, cosine minus sine. <clears throat> so 
So zero over here is going to go down, is that right? So if the position is positive, the velocity, wait, that doesn't make sense. So Okay, so this one's gonna be zero here. No, wait, this is. Oh no, this one is pi. You guys were getting me confused. Okay, so this one is pi. This one is pi over two. This one is three pi over two. And this one is two pi. Okay. Uh, This one goes like this, but it's negative. So I have to draw it. So pi is zero is going to be. Did I get my, my, oh no, it is fine. So this one is zero. So over here, you have maximum velocity. Um, when the amplitude is maximum, so minus C or C, your velocity is zero. So you get your turning point. Okay, awesome. So, This is what you know from your baby mechanics. But I have never seen this derivation, so it's probably wrong. <clears throat> so the other thing to notice is that the force I'll put it over here. Is minus derivative of the potential with respect to x. This is a function of x. So the force is going to be one half of two k x uh, negative. Is this negative? And so you get Hooke's law. And if you take another derivative, so the derivative of the force with respect to the displacement, you can put another negative. You can keep both positive. Uh, then you will get k. OK? So this is important. The spring constant is the second derivative of the potential. Why is that important? Well, what does the first derivative give you? Especially if you make it equal to zero, like we're here. The first derivative of what? The potential. So the first derivative of this, one of these curves. Gives you the force. Where is where is the force zero? Well, at x equals zero. Yeah. Right. So over here, at the bottom, if you leave something over here and you don't move it or anything, it will stay there. If you put it anywhere else, it will start moving. And if it has kinetic energy, it will continue moving. 
And if it can disperse its kinetic energy, perhaps you know, via friction or something, it will, it will eventually end up here. So, uh, if so, so please, uh, why is that the maximum velocity is at when is at the minimum? When you have kinetic energy, because the force is zero. So yes. over here. You are exerting a force in the direction opposite of motion, so it's decreasing the velocity. But then, when it's moving in this direction, it is in the same direction, and so it is increasing the velocity. And it's maximum here, because as, as soon as it starts moving in this direction, the force is in that direction, so the velocity decreases. That's why the velocity is maximum here, but it's also where the force is zero. So what about the, the spring constant? What does it tell you? This tells you where the maximum or the minimum value is. It's an, it's an ex extremum. What about that one? The spring constant also tells you whether the parabola is uh, um, concave up or concave down. So notice that you could have a point It. We'll have a point like this. Ah. Right, so the force is also zero there. But the spring constant, which is a second derivative, will be negative. So this one gives you stable equilibrium. This one is unstable equilibrium. So here, you exert a force in any direction, and you're going to go back. Here, you exert, exert a force in any direction, that's it. Yeah, so I asked you, uh, I guess at the beginning of the class, if you could have a different shape. And you can. Uh, like pretty much every function that is um, even, right? Even power is going to look like this. And so you have stable equilibrium. You know, the, the solutions here will look sometimes very different. But you know, it's still you can keep it in here. If you have odd terms like a like a cube, it will look like this, and that will make it that could make it unstable, depending on how uh, strong that cubic term is. So. The cool thing about you know, this model is that if you have a potential that looks. Well, this one is that this maximum, or this crest is, a, is, is for unstable equilibrium. The force is zero you know, at the very top, but only at that point. Right, because it's the derivative of the potential. So over here, the potential, the derivative is zero. It goes from positive to negative. So the potential has a turning point. So the force is zero. You could put, you know, it's like putting like an egg, you know, kind of like on its long axis on the table. You could do it if you practice a lot. If you have any kind of potential, let's say that it looks ah, I'm getting frustrated with this. I'm gonna try it out. Do you want to use this? Yes. This one works. It's just that I get confused with the one that doesn't work. OK, let's say that it looks like that. Guess what? Every part, you can approximate it with a parabola. That's why this model is powerful. OK, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about crystals.
I say like them. So first I'm gonna draw my favorite structure. I think uh, Homero will know. Which one is it, Homero? These two? Almost. This is it? Yeah. Body center cubic. Huh? How many have taken, how many of you have taken solid state? About half, okay. So body center cubic looks, you have a cube, and um, you have all the atoms over here in the, in the cube. And then you have another one in between, in the middle. Yeah. Okay, so that's a body center cubic structure. It's pretty common um, in solids. So if you want to move in the along the diagonals, so if you want to move this atom along the diagonals, you'll find this one, and this one, and this one, and this one, and you know, if you remember a potential between atoms uh, looks like this, which is also, you know, how the uh, centrifugal um, effective potential you know, plus kinetic looks like when you have a rotating body. So it will look like this, you know, it moves in this direction, I guess a uh, smaller distance, so it moves like this. The force increases, you know, if you look at it, it looks like a parabola, so you can approximate it. And it's gonna feel a force in the opposite direction, so it's gonna move back. It is, you know, seems to be safe there. Can you find a way for it to escape the middle atom? This is all you have. You don't have the rest of the structure yet. So you have your middle atom over here. If you move along the diagonals here, 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 it finds another atom. So it cannot escape. How can it escape? Right? This way, right? Easy. So what does the BC, the body center cubic structure does? I mean, what does it do? <laughs> well, it puts another one over here. Another one over here, one over here, one down here, out here, and over here. And escape. And if you look at each one of them, they all look the same. So this is a stable structure. Um, I had a drawing of the FCC structure, but in the interest of time, it's the same thing. You know, it, it has more directions. It's, I think the FCC is a little bit more complicated. But what about the cubic, simple cubic structure? This one. Is it stable? Do you know of any material that has a simple cubic structure? There's like one or two. I think polonium has this structure. It's extremely rare. Why would it be rare? Well, I guess it has kind of the symmetry, you know, of the other one. Um, I guess if you move in this direction, you will find something eventually, or in this direction, or in this one. And then in the diagonals, you will also find this one. But, you know, it is, uns it is rare, very rare, because this one is so far away. You know, so it's, it will be m more efficient if you put one in the middle and then it's closer. And you know the forces will cancel out in the middle so you can put something there. So this one 
pretty rare. So, is it stable? You know, actually, I'm thinking about it right now. I think it would be a pretty cool experiment, a uh, computational experiment, to see why do you need the force constants to be in order to make it stable? It, you know, it is stable, but in nature, it doesn't matter very much if it is stable in general. What matters is that it is the most stable. And so this is almost never the most stable, right? Because you can put one here, and it's more stable. OK, so a um, few things. We can include friction. If we include friction, um, then the force will look like this. Um, and yeah, the force is equal to mass times acceleration. So we'll have a term that is dependent on the velocity. <coughs> So this creates a damped harmonic oscillator. So you will lose energy. Phonons are better described by this, because otherwise your phonon will just live forever, you know, a, a, a wave in the uh, atomic vibrations. But they don't. They find the other ones. They scatter each other. Um, if you include higher terms, this might change its shape, its shape a little bit. Maybe it will look, you know, maybe a little bit more elongated on this side than on this one. If you put like a cubic term or something like that. Uh, the Leonard-Jones potential, which describes accurately well, and the potential between atoms is always going to look something like this. So a parabola down here, you know, you can put it and approximate it. So you know, this works for atoms. And um, I guess also for planets. OK, so let's do a little bit of math. You know, this is simple stuff. I don't, I don't know how I can, or I have spent like 20 years thinking about it. So we're going to consider a system that is conservative. So we don't have uh, friction. We don't have dampening. You can kind of live forever. Um, we will assume that the transformations to get the generalized coordinates, uh, how do I call it? The Q's. Um, are not explicitly time dependent. So we're simplifying the problem quite a bit. But we're bringing it closer to what we can work with analytically. Uh, the last thing is that. Mm, No, this is not an assumption, this is a consequence. The system is in equilibrium if what? It's not moving? What how do you describe that? 
what is going on in terms of the potential, in terms of the forces. Right? So because we are grown-ups now, the generalized force, which is the derivative of the potential with respect to the uh, generalized coordinates, evaluated at the equilibrium position, it's zero. So, well, if this is not true, then you will have an acceleration. So, you know, it has to be true. But we're generalizing it. Uh, we already know that if this is true, then the potential is either at a minimum or at a maximum. So we're going to consider the case in which it is at a minimum. So if you had a bunch of atoms, like in a crystal, what would the case uh, Qs be? Yeah, a few months ago, we talked about the number of generalized coordinates and the number of degrees of freedom. Okay. So if you had a bunch of atoms, what will Q be? QI? Constant motion? Hmm? Constant. Yes. So you will have, I'm sure you will have 3N. Right? Each atom can move in uh, three orthogonal positions. So you have you have a lot of cues, right? Um, this one will be, you know, Avogadro's number, order of magnitude. So each orthogonal displacement of each atom, it's a generalized coordinate. So if we we're going to consider a small perturbation, qi equals q not i plus uh, eta i. So if we have our potential down here, this is all the atoms you can imagine. The way I guess, the way I imagine this is you have all your atoms in a crystal. They are all in the equilibrium position, the lattice position. We saw that they, you know, they don't move. They're very stable there. You displace one of them a little bit, very little. Okay, so if you do that, then you can Taylor expand the potential. It's going to be Q1, um, everything, Qn. It's going to be so. This is a Taylor expansion in n variables. So it's equal to v q01 q oh my gosh, these q's are horrible. That's the, I guess the zeroth order. And then the first order will be uh, derivative of the potential with respect to qi evaluated at the equilibrium position and times theta i. Then we have the second order. It's going to be the second derivative of the potential with respect to qi and with respect to qj. Evaluated at the equilibrium position and then you have the two displacements i and j and so on. <coughs> Do you recognize this, Omero? Mm -hmm. This is the born von Karman model. Oh. Okay, so <clears throat> this term is zero. Do you agree? Good. And this term is just a constant, and this is a potential energy, so we can move it over there or just forget about it. So this is the um, 
it is a second order uh, term for the potential, but it is the first approximation that doesn't vanish. So this is kind of cool. Um, this, the, the first one is not zero, but it's a constant. So since this is a potential energy, we can just move it to the other side and still the same. This one is by definition zero. This one is the first term that doesn't vanish. So if we want to write this in Einstein notation, the potential is, um, oh, I forgot the one half. Um, we can write it as V I J eta I eta J. And if you look at um, what we have over here, this is kind of your x squared. This is your dis two displacements. And this is your force constant. And you can put the one half in there. You can integrate it here, doesn't matter. This is Hooke's law. It looks a little strange, but it is Hooke's law. So if you have um, uh, n atoms, and they can move in three different directions, we can rewrite this. Well, actually, we don't need to rewrite it, but we have one of these for each direction. So it's going to look. Usually, the way you will find it in the literature is an alpha. Well, I'm going to rewrite it over here. Okay, so you have atom I and atom J, and they can move in direction alpha and in direction beta. Alpha and beta can be the same direction. So you have several options. You have, for example, this motion. This is atom I, this is atom J, and you know, they move against each other. So that is one force constant. But you can also have this case, you see have I and J, but now alpha and beta are different. This force constant is going to be different. And this force constant is a little bit different than, than when you, what you see with you know, the, I guess the simplest Hooke's law, because that one is just like you know, going back and forth. This one is a transverse force constant. But this one is the same as this one. So there are symmetries, as you might imagine. And so that's why we have our rotation operations. You can put all of this in a matrix. Shouldn't it be covariant, that one? Shouldn't it be what? Covariant. It's like contravariant or covariant? Mm. The IJ Symmetric. Be. Yeah, right? So you have atom I and atom J, and you have the three different directions. So you have V, I, J, um, alpha, alpha? V, I, J, alpha, beta. V, I, J, alpha, gamma. These are just directions, remember? So uh, x, y, and z. I, J, beta, beta, which is actually going to be, if you have a cubic symmetry, it's same as alpha, alpha. B, I, J, gamma, gamma. B, 
DIJ beta gamma. And yes, this one goes over here. Is that what you meant? No, I was, I was thinking when you um, expand, when you use this um, eta there, uh, the IJ, this one? Yeah, those. I mean, if I'm not mistaken, um, when you contract, it should give you B, right? When you contract, so it should give you B? Yeah, the, left, the left hand side, it should give you the left hand side. So, uh, the alpha, beta, Yes. Either of them should be um, covariant. I mean, like down, it should be down, I guess. So remember that this one is Einstein notation. So this is the sum of everything. So the, the potential is, you know, all these displacements. The matrix looks like that. It's a um, um, force constant matrix. So I'm going to tell you something really cool that I really like. If you, where can I put this one? I'm gonna put it over here. Um, here you have some displacement. I mean, maybe this one moves in this direction. Um, it doesn't have to be like just in X or in Y. We have a combination there, so it could be. This will be described by some combination there, and maybe this one is like that. So you have a connection here. and the direction. This is a line. If you go to the third order, that I didn't continue writing over here, but it's gonna be the third derivative of the potential with respect to qi, qj, and qk. Okay, so the second order was the movement of two atoms. The third order is the movement of three. The fourth order is the movement of four atoms. If you have, say that this one moves in this direction, okay? Then you're going to have, I'm gonna move this one. If you have a surface, and if you have four atoms, um, well, it will be out of the plane, potentially. I guess it can still be a surface, but um, it's going to be a volume, and so on. So this one is a matrix. But if you go to third order, you're going to have k over here and a k over here. What is this? I guess this one. Cancel. Yeah, what order? Who said that? What's a girl? Mm -hmm. Oh, Daniela, is you? What order? Third order. Yeah, so matrix is second order, then you go to a third, third order, and you, know, you have a tensor. Uh, of whatever order you have in here of your approximation to describe the movement of these particles but the move what they're actually describing is how because they're moving in the different directions how your surface is distorted the first one is just you know how that line is distorted sporting how the surface is distorted how your 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 surf your I guess your volume is distorted I don't know I think this is really really cool so if you you know, this captures the, the um, many body uh, effects in your system. So you can potentially describe them with classical mechanics, you know. You don't need any fancy quantum mechanics or anything. 
the problem is that this is infinite. You know, if you have an infinite number of atoms, then you need an infinite number of parameters to describe the movement. You know, I guess the good thing is that this one is divided by one over three factorial, right? The next one is one over four factorial and so on. So each term becomes less important. You can cut it at some point. What if we use the tilde expression to describe it? Uh, could you repeat that? The what, if, what if we use the tilde expression to describe it? What do you use the Taylor expression to describe? Like, what is the Taylor expansion describing? No, like, why did you use the Taylor expansion to describe the potential? Um, because it is a parabola, so you can add, like, pretty much an infinite number of terms to it when you move it a little bit. Um, okay, so I... Okay. Um, you give me three minutes. Man, I'm gonna send you this video that I found on YouTube. It's about this guy um, imitating physics professors. And one of the really cool ones is there's one minute left in the class and they explain like half of the class in one minute. I'm not like that, right? Very quickly, because it is the same thing. Uh, the potential uh, kinetic energy is going to look like this. QI dot QJ dot. And I guess when you put in your Q0, I Q0, J. Um, this one is constant, this one is constant also, but this one is going to be 1 half M I J, eta I dot, eta J dot. This one, it already looks like the potential over there, like, I guess when we had the second order. So if you want to construct your Lagrangian, you want this one. So what can you Taylor expand? All the mass. This is going to be weird. So Q1, Qn, Mj, Q0, one, Q zero N. So this is a function, right? And IJ is a function of these ones. It's a function of the generalized coordinates. It's a little weird to think about it. And then you have other stuff. The first derivative. Already has an eta over here. Um, see the dot? Yes, you do see dot. No, it's not a dot. Okay, that's it. Um, but you don't want this one because if you put the m, this one, with this eta in your kinetic energy here, then you're going to have terms that are going to be difficult to get rid of. So this is where you cut your approximation. You only have this part. So, you know, the end result, just take the derivatives to, to get the uh, equation of motion. So, the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to Q dot derivative dt, right? Minus the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to Q uh, i i equals zero. So, you do that. Um, your Lagrangian is going to be this one, which is T. Minus that one. 
So B I J eta I eta I eta J dot dot I J. So it looks the same as the potential energy if you allow this term, the mass, to play the role of the potential. Is that possible? Can you explain to me what's going on there? Can the mass depend on the on the positions? There's a there's a small displacement. These are small displacements. So what's going on? One way to look at it, well, I guess it's the way I look at it. Um, just like you have, you know, like in your solid, you have the different force constants for the different pairs or triplets um, of atoms. The potential looks different in every direction that you move in. And so the kinetic energy, you know, if you just like add a little bit, um, it, will look, it will be the mechanical energy and it will have to describe you know, the, the different uh, shapes of the potential. And so it has to be a little different in every direction. One way, and I guess another way to look at it is, usually you describe the kinetic energy of one particle with respect to you know, some, some origin. It's the velocity with respect to that origin. But here, um, you're describing two particles that are, are moving with one mass. So this is some sort of fit, I guess. Uh, so this will be an, like an effective mass. And depending on you know, which pair of atoms you have, the distance, you know, the direction, this mass has to look different. Also, this mass, because it, you know, it has uh, described the potential, or I guess Vd equal to one minus the potential, or energy minus the potential. Um, depending on how the rest of the atoms look, this one is going to look different. Right? So the symmetry matters. So we're only going to see the case in which the mass of ij, mass ij equals zero if i is different than j. So we're not going to consider the off diagonal terms to make things simpler. But I guess it's good to know that in general, it, it will be described by a matrix. All right, thank you. Mm-hmm.